So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, depending where you are. Uh, welcome to uh, another online platform uh, seminar. Um, today we have Lester Chen presenting his very interesting uh, research on equilibrium selection in platform competition. Uh, but before uh, I let Chen start, uh, let me just quickly uh, uh, remind about the, um, how this new format works. So we have an hour. 40 to 45 minutes uh, is for Lester's talk and uh, then the rest for Q&A. Uh, during the talk, Lester is going to make a couple of stops for clarifying questions. Uh, those questions, you can uh, write them in chat and I will, uh, I will ask them in bulk. Uh, for the Q&A at the end, you can just unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, so with that, uh, Lester, I know the screen is yours. You can now start sharing the slides and take it off. Yeah, yeah, sure. So let me first share the screen. Let's see. So um, let me see just a moment. So can you see my cursor moving? Yes. Oh, great. So thank you, Hannah, for the introduction. And I also want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my paper. And once again, Mr. Chen, and I'm a job market candidate from Boston University. And today I'm going to present one of my paper, which is about two-side markets. So one of the most difficult challenges in two-side markets as emphasized by Kyle and Julian's seminal paper, is the chicken and egg problem. So in short, typically there are positive cross-size network effects in two-side markets, which leads to the multiple equilibria issue. So consider a typical market model, state one, and all agents simultaneously make their If there's one, and suppose for simplicity that from the same sides are identical, then there can be two equilibria in stage two. All agents join the platform or no one joins the platform. If there are competing platforms in equilibrium, all agents will coordinate on one of the platforms if the network effects are strong enough. But which platform will they coordinate on? In other words, how should we deal with multiple equilibria? So in the literature, researchers imposes various selection criteria to single out an equilibria. So a popular selection criterion is to select the Pareto dominant equilibria. However, this criterion often fails under platform competition because coordinating on one of the platform need not Pareto dominate the other. And there are other selection criteria in the literature, and I'm not going to go through them one by one. But each selection criterion only works for some cases, but not the others. Moreover, different equilibrium selection criteria often leads to different predictions and implications. And therefore, there's a methodological challenge in selecting a suitable equilibrium. So in response to this challenge, in this presentation, I'm going to propose using another approach called the potential game approach to resolve the multiple equilibria issue in two side markets. And as we will see, uh, this approach has solid micro foundations in the game theory literature, widely supported by experimental results, and it can select a unique equilibrium for many two-side market models. So, the concept of potential games was formalized by Mondra and Shapley. And in short, a game is a potential game if it is strategically equivalent to an identical interest game. And first, let us take a look on this example in which the two players simultaneously decide to join platform A or platform B. 
So coordinating on either platform is an equilibrium. But player one prefers to coordinate on A, while player two prefers to coordinate on B. So clearly, Pareto dominance is not applicable. And in fact, none of the population criteria in the literature can unambiguously select a unique equilibrium for this model. But now, let me show you a selection criteria that works. So first of all, observe that this scheme is strategically equivalent to the following identical interest scheme in which the two players share the same utility function. So I just need one number for each cell. So to see this, suppose player two joins A. For player one, joining A is better than joining B by three units in the original game and by nine units in the identical interest game. Similarly, if player two joins B, for player one, joining B is better than joining A by one unit in the original game and by three units in the identical interest game. See that the change in player one's payoff from switching actions is proportional to the corresponding change in the identical interest game. And the same logic applies to player two. And therefore, these two games are strategically equivalent. So any game that is strategically equivalent to an identical interest game is called a potential game. And the corresponding common utility function is called the potential function. Moreover, for any identical interest games, Generically, there's a unique Pareto dominance equilibrium, which corresponds to the maximizer of the potential function. And for this example, it is both players join A. As proposed by Mondra and Shapley, the selection criterion based on potential games is to first transform a game into an identical interest game and then select the corresponding Pareto dominance equilibrium. And it is called potential maximization. So let me give you an intuition why potential maximization makes sense. So suppose the two players indeed play this identical interest game. Then we probably would expect that they are more likely to coordinate on this Pareto dominance equilibrium. And if we also expect that two strategically equivalent games to, should have similar strategic behavior, then we should expect that they also coordinate on A in the original game. And in fact, for two player two action games, potential maximization always selects the risk dominance equilibrium. So in the game theory literature, Many equilibrium selection criteria coincide with potential maximization if a game is a potential game. So uh, as mentioned, risk dominance coincides with potential maximization for two by two games. And for more general games, the unique equilibrium under global game selection, perfect foresight dynamics and log linear dynamics is the potential maximizer. And even without relying on other selection criteria, the potential maximizer itself is also robust to incomplete information. Moreover, potential maximization is widely supported by experimental results. And therefore, this selection criterion is justified by many micro foundations and experimental results. Although potential maximization is applicable only to potential games, many two-side market models are indeed potential games. So for example, for the foremost cited papers in two-side markets, all of their main models are weighted potential games. And therefore, 
we can apply potential maximization to resolve the multiple equilibrium issue. And in waffles, I will apply potential maximization to a special case of Armstrong's model in which agents from the same size are identical. And I'm going to derive some novel insights into two side markets. So maybe I can pause here to see if there are any questions. So, uh, there are no questions in the chat, but if anyone- Is it possible to ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Uh, my question is this, uh, you said that there are many, uh, uh, that there is a, uh, there are many experimental results that support uh, the choice of uh, equilibrium. Can you say something about them? Right. Uh, sure. So basically, I mean, these experiments are like lab experiments, and then they usually will play some kind of coordination game. So I guess the uh, oldest research is comparing Pareto dominance and risk dominance in two by two games. So those are the experiment experiments. But actually for like uh, more general games, like out of two, two games is not applicable. And uh, one of the extensions is potential maximization. And then people still find that like, uh, times will coordinate on the potential chance. I, I, I ask because, uh, because in my experience, uh, typically in coordination games, uh, when you take them to the lab, you don't get clear results, and uh, none of the none of the equilibrium selection uh, criteria that uh, we use in theory uh, actually has any predictive power in the lab. That's my experience. Um, I see. I see. Uh, uh, I think that's actually true. I mean, in mixed results, so sometimes you can find that it supports potential maximization. In other contexts, maybe other equilibrium selection. But at least we have some research that supports potential maximization. But yeah, and maybe we can, there are also other literature that supports that area in other environments. So, all right, so maybe I can hear the model. So, in the model, Monthly platform shows two size of agents, side one agents and n two side two agents. So the payoff of a side one agent from joining the platform depends also join the platform. and measures the per interact benefit with each participant set by the platform. Off of a side two agent takes a similar form, and if an agent does not the platform is pay off. Pay off is equal to its profit. The C and C two are the marginal cost of the agents, and the timing is standard. Uh, platforms prices stage one. And all agents simultaneously make their joining decision interested in the subgame perfect equilibria of this game. So now analyze this model. And first, that's by the platform a positive or too high. All agents platform or no one joins the platform. I think we lost. Uh, right, Lister, we, we lost you for. Uh, oh, yeah, we lost, for we lost you for a moment yeah. and lost the, the slide. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Okay. Yeah. Welcome back. So, yeah. uh, when 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 do I get lost? 
I think we're fine on the on this on the setup, right? You you run okay. three D and uh, maybe we lost a couple of seconds, but I think we're we're good. So sure. well, maybe I will repeat these slides, or yeah. it's okay. Yeah, sure. So basically, uh, when the prices set by the platforms are both positive and not too high, there will be two equilibria in stage two. So all agents join the platform or no one platform. And under Pareto dominance, all agents will join the platform and never multiple equilibria. And therefore, under Pareto dominance, the optimal pricing strategy for the platform is to set the highest possible prices of size, such that all agents will join the platform in state. And therefore, the platform's equilibrium profit is given by this. And actually, for this, we verify that Pareto dominance, proofness, insulating tariffs, and for quality with the monofocal platform. So in other words, these are the under a typical selection criteria. So now, let us analyze the same model. So first of all, uh, we show that every sub game in stage two is a weighted potential game with the potential function given by this. And the proof is simply to verify that the function phi, phi here, is indeed a potential function. So to see this, for a size one agent, suppose there are N1 size one participants and N2 size two participants. Lester, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but there is a clarifying question about the previous slide, and I think it may be worthwhile. Uh, this one? Previous, even earlier. Uh, um, yes, the platform optimal pricing, uh, P1 is equal to V1 and 2, and uh, why is it V1 and 2 and not V1 and 1? Ah, because, uh, so you can see that the payoff here, the not, so basically the payoff of of a side one agent depends on the number of side two agents. And if everyone, every side two agent joins, then it is V1 and N2. Is it clear? Yeah, Michael, does, that, does it answer your question? Uh, you're muted. <laughs> I guess N2, it, that's not the total number of agents, is it? that are joining platform one. Ah, so small letter N2 is those who join the platform and capital letter N2 is those with the number of agents. And in the first equilibrium, which is all agents join the platform, so small letter N2 becomes capital letter N2. Is it clear? What, what about capital letter N1? Means one. I mean, how? what is the total number of agents available? Uh, so there are a total number of side one agents is capital M1. Total number of side two agents is capital uh, I, I see. Yeah. I see. Those are the different sides. Okay, thanks. Now I'm not confused. Oh, no problem. You're welcome. Okay, so let us continue the proof of this lemma by showing that every sub-game in stage two is indeed a weighted potential game. And the proof, again, is to verify that this function phi is indeed the potential function. So, for a size one agent, the size participants and pay off in joining the platform or not for simply you want. And if this side one agent joins the platform, there will be M1 plus one side one participants. And if not, there will only be M1 side one participants. Therefore, the corresponding difference in phi is given by this. And with some simplifications, we will arrive this far. So clearly, 
the change in these sites where agents pay off from switching actions is proportional to the corresponding change in fine. And the same logic applies to a site two agent. And therefore, every sub game in stage two is indeed a weighted potential game with the potential function given by phi. So, after identifying the potential function, the next step is to identify the potential maximizer. And when there are multiple equilibria in stage two, the potentials of the two equilibria are given by this. So the first one corresponds to all agents joining the platform, and the second one corresponds to no one joining the platform. And potential maximization is to select the equilibrium with a higher potential. And by the following lemma. So basically, under potential maximization, the platform has to leave enough surplus to agents by setting sufficiently low prices in stage one, such that all agents will join the platform in two. Otherwise, none of them will join the platform. And therefore, potential maximization imposes an additional constraint to the platform's profit maximization problem in stage one. And generically, and without laws of generality, assume that the per interaction benefits V1 is less than V2. And by solving the above problem, we find that the platform's optimal pricing strategy is to set zero price on site one and the highest possible price on site two. Therefore, the platform's glib by this. So um, maybe I can pause here for see if any uh, any questions. There are no more questions in the chat. If anyone else has a question, you can just unmute yourself. Just to clarify, this is also the payoff and the pessimistic belief. Uh, yes. So basically, this if we apply pessimistic beliefs, gets uh, the same outcome here. But let me delay the discussion a little. To be I disc the results, I will come back to the uh, that pessimistic beliefs gives us the same prediction. All right. So let me first discuss my results, and then yeah, we'll go we'll go back to that point. So this table summarizes and compares the results with the benchmark results. So first of all, under both criteria, the platform charges site the same maximum price and fully extracts their shares. By contrast, under potential maximization, the platform provides free access for site and leaves them loss of share plus. And therefore, the equilibrium profit is also significantly lower. In this case, uh, I call size one the side and side two the money side. Three key implications in this model. The first key implication is that the platform always subs one side and monetizes the other. So this is actually a very common pricing strategy in two side markets. So for example, women enjoy free admissions on ladies' nights while men pay an admission fee. Shoppers pay nothing to shopping malls while retailers pay the rent. And consumers are essentially charged to use credit cards while merchants pay for the service. And in the literature, this pricing strategy is called the divide and conquer strategy. And key decide only as V1 or V2 is larger. So as we decide in the, the total two on each side. 
So this implies that the platform need not monetize the sites with more agents. So for example, shopping malls have more shoppers than retailers, but only the retailers are charged. And similarly, the money subsidy size is independent of the marginal cost C1 and C2 for serving the agents. So for example, for open access journals, the marginal cost of an additional reader is zero and revealing a paper is costly, but these journals only charge authors. And the third key implication is about the optimal design of the platform. So oftentimes, uh, the one and V2 are not exogenous, but rather the platform's endogenous choice. So for example, Shopping malls are often decided to maximize the shopper's travel distances by locating popular stores far from each other. This benefits the retailers, but harms the shoppers. And therefore, the following discussion is comparative statics by varying V1 and V2. So under Pareto dominance, the optimal design of the platform is to favor both sides. That is in, to increase both V1 and V2. But this is not true under potential maximization. So as we can see, the platform's equilibrium profit is independent of V1, as long as V1 is less than V2. Therefore, the optimal design of the platform Moreover, under Pareto dominance, the social surplus is just equal to the platform's profit, which means that the optimal design of the platform also maximizes social surplus. By contrast, under potential maximization, the optimal design of the platform is likely to be socially optimal because the platform has no incentive to increase Taiwan's agent surplus by increasing fee. So as we can see, different selection criteria can lead to totally different predictions and implications. And this is the method methodological challenge in two-side markets. But nevertheless, potential maximization gives more realistic predictions in this monoplatform homogeneous agent model. In particular, the platform always divides and conquers. The optimal design of the platform only depends on per inch benefits. And I mean, the money subsidy size only depends on the per interaction benefits. And the optimal design of the platform is to favor the money size only. And in fact, these predictions uh, are already capturing many distinctive features of two-side markets, which means that these distinctive features need not rely on platform competition progenious agents, but instead it relies on a suitable equilibrium selection criteria. So now I will pause here and I will first answer Bruno's question. So it is true that if we applied uh, pessimistic beliefs on this model, we will get exactly the same results here. But I want to, uh, I don't want to overemphasize this point because this is really a non-generic result for this highly stylized model. So later on, when I generalize the model to platform competition, then clearly they are not going to coincide. And also, if we have heterogeneous model and also going to not, uh, it's not going to coincide. And I can actually tell you the rationale behind why in general they are not going to coincide. So under potential maximization, if we go back to the previous page, you can see that the platform can actually charge. So it is okay that I charge both sides, but it turns out that if I do the maximization program, it is not optimal to charge both sides. This is better to charge on one side and leave the surplus on the other side. 
But if we apply pessimistic, basically you cannot charge both sides because whenever you charge both sides, then I was the uh, no, no participation equilibrium. So that force will force you to have to subsidize one side and charge the other side. So the driving force are quite different. So we expect that they coincide in a more general case. And the third point that I want to make is that, uh, as you can see, this table represents predictions under a typical selection criterion versus potential maximization together with pessimistic beliefs. Suppose if we have, if we don't know about potential maximization, beliefs. Prediction. which is uh, justified by many game theory literature and experimental results, then we can believe that this is uh, more justifiable on the right-hand side results. So I guess this is my comments. Hi, Lester. Uh, we, we lost you for a moment as well, uh, again. Oh, really? Uh, yes, uh, yes. The, uh, the internet connection seems to be uh, uh, bad. So, so we did not hear the last uh, couple of seconds, just so you know. Oh, the couple of seconds I'm talking about this on the left hand side, it is representing a prediction under the Plato dominant relation proof. This and on we don't maximization and size this is the right prediction because it is justified by many session but now we have justified which potential maximizing more micro funded equilibrium selection criteria that makes right hand side more plausible. Yeah, I, I think you can, there are no other questions. Sure, okay, okay, then I will continue and go back to, all right. Uh, sorry to interrupt, can you just try to uh, turn off your camera and uh, see if the, the quality is better for everybody, just to hear you and see your slides. I see. Let me see. Let me see how. So I stop video and start video again. Uh, ju just st uh, stop your camera. Hmm? Just uh, click on the. Uh, just stop. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, oh you mean I just stopped the video? I see. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank, you. Sure. thank you. Go ahead. Okay. So in the remaining time, I'm going to demonstrate how potential maximization can resolve the multiple equilibria issue under platform competition. So the baseline model is generalized into a duopoly platform model with platforms A and B. So now A and B set prices in stage one and all simultaneously make their joining decisions in stage two. Now, in this model, each agent has to join one and only one platform. So basically, they decide to join either A or B. So the pay of a agent from joining platform M depends on the number of platform M meaning A or B. Depends on the number of side two agents who also join platform M. And I allows the site one agents to derive different per interaction benefits at different paths. And the payoff of, of a site agent takes a similar form. So for simplicity, I assume away the marginal cost of observing the agents. And following Armstrong and Wright, 
I assume that the, the subscription fees set by the platforms are non-negative. So they argue that this is a reasonable assumption on pure subscription models, because strictly subsidizing agents with all these every selection problems, moral hazard problems. So now let us analyze this model. So first of all, I define P1 Delta and P2 Delta as the price differences platforms for site one and site two respectively. So when the price difference is not too large, there will be two equilibria in stage two. All agents join A or all agents join B. So clearly, and in fact, Amongst all popular selection criteria, only faculty is applicable to this model. So faculty, uh, as we have discussed, it is uh, also known as optimistic, pessimistic beliefs. So at the end of this talk, I will further compare faculty potential maximization. So now let us analyze this model under potential maximization. So similar to the baseline model, we can easily show that the potential function given by this. And the, simply to verify that the function phi is defined here, in this, the potential function, I'm going to skip the proof. The proof is very similar to the proof. So after identifying the potential function, the next step is to identify the potential maximizer. Recall that there are two equilibria in stage two when the price differences are not too large and potential maximization is to select the equilibrium with a higher potential. And it is summarized by the following lemma. So under potential maximization, we can view all site one and site two agents as a representative agent who either joined platform A or platform B. So more precisely, we can view V1 times V2 as the value of the platform, these two terms as the prices of joining the platform, and the representative agent will join platform that gives him a higher net value. And therefore, under potential maximization, when platforms A and B set analogous to the standard Bertrand competition. So generically, and without loss of generality, assume that your A is higher than that of B. So the standard Bertrand competition would imply that B will set zero both sides, so that this will slightly undercut B, such that uh, it kept the entire market. And therefore, this inequality sign becomes a with some rearrangements, we will obtain this equation. Object constraint, platform A will maximize its profit by optimally on the two, two sides. And therefore, this problem will build a unique equilibrium outcome. We summarize the following. So first of all, these, can, these two criteria are both generic and without loss. So the first one is about the one is about the two size. So the one I've already explained, it determines the identity of the dominant platform. And the second one states that the average and 
this condition determines the money subsidy size of the dominant platform. So in this case, size one is the subsidy side and size two is the money side. So similar to the baseline model, uh, the, mon the dominant platform always divides and conquers. But now, uh, the money subsidy size depends on the per interaction benefits across average per interaction benefits across the two platforms rather than its own per interaction benefits d1a and d2a and therefore the competition versus the money subsidy size of a dominant and i'm going to use and the following example to illustrate this point so in this example a favors side one more than side two but B favors side two much more than side one. And suppose initially that A is a monopolist. And by the previous analysis, we know that A will monetize side one and subsidize side two. And suppose B now enters the market and under platform competition, by the previous proposition, we know that A still dominates the market, but now, a subsidizes side one and monetizes side two. And therefore, the money subsidy side of a dominant platform is reversed under platform competition. And uh, observe that if A and B are separate monopolists, then B actually makes a higher profit than A because B can extract more surplus from one side. So this implies that the optimal design of a monopoly platform might not work well under platform competition. So under platform competition, if the two platforms are very competitive, then uh, the optimal design of the platforms tends to favor both sides because the platform with a smaller product of V1 and V2 is defeated in equilibrium and has zero market share. But if one of the platforms is inferior, say if both V1B and V2B are close to zero, then these two terms are close to zero. And this whole term is close to V2A, meaning that the optimal design of A tends to favor only the money side in order to extract more surplus from that side. So let me pause here to see if there are any questions. There are no questions in the chat. So if anyone mm. has any questions, you can just unmute yourself. Okay. I, uh, I think at this point, uh, maybe you should uh, continue and then we will yeah. move to Q&A. Sure, sure, yeah. Okay. So lastly, I want to spend some minutes to discuss uh, faculty and potential maximization. So for faculty, most of us know that faculty is to assume that all agents always coordinate on a pre-specified platform whenever there are multiple equilibria. And therefore, faculty treats platforms asymmetrically. By contrast, potential maximization treats platforms a symmetric in the sense that the identity platform is not met. For with a specific this has to determine which platform should the platform. Potential optimization identity platform. So in the previous example, the one with a larger product of one and two. So clip is dominant focal because all agents coordinate on this form. But this is an equilibrium rather than an end from the start. Uh, let's say I just wanted to let you know that we keep losing you. So, uh, so unfortunately, yep. I think 
we lost Lester altogether. Yep. Yeah. I hope he comes back uh, soon for Q&A. Uh, and, and at least what we can say is that I think we got the, the most uh, of his presentation in. So um, I guess we'll wait a little bit longer. And uh, in case uh, he's not coming back in another minute, I think we will need to call the seminar short. Um, but uh, yeah, so. Um, I guess uh, let me uh, thank uh, Lester in absentia uh, for uh, for the uh, you know I think it's an interesting concept. I had a couple of questions I wanted to ask him at the end, but I guess I'll ask him privately. Uh, I will share a question with you, so something to ponder. Uh, he mentioned that some of the uh, platform competition games uh, can be represented as potential games and I uh, wonder to what extent this concept, uh, you know, how general this concept is and uh, which uh, platform competition games can be characterized as potential games and which cannot uh, and where we can apply this concept or not. Uh, otherwise, I, I thought it was, it was interesting and uh, again, thinking uh, Lester in absentia uh, since he's still not back. And uh, with that, I think uh, we are going to I, end the seminar. I had, I had a, a question too, uh, a more general question that we may want to think about. And that is, as far as I know, uh, dating websites, uh, dating websites for heterosexuals, um, usually charge both sides, uh, men and women. Uh, and the, the competition doesn't seem to uh, uh, force a zero price on one side and a positive price on the other. Maybe they're both willing to pay an equal amount. I don't know uh, what the reason might be. So I can I can actually chime in on that. Having having done uh, uh, some research on on dating sites specifically as as platforms, uh, for legal reason in most countries, for legal reason of gender discrimination, they are not allowed to charge different prices to the two sites. And and in fact, the bars nights out uh, uh, nights night out policy has been challenged as gender discrimination, and in some jurisdictions they had won. So nights uh, ladies nights out are banned from uh, in, in some counties in, in US, but for yeah. the online dating sites, it's just illegal. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I'm I'm also uh, I do remember a very long time ago when I was dating. Um, they, I was, there, there were platforms that specialized in women. Um, uh, they weren't online, but they were still platforms and they, and they, uh, kept inviting men, please, please uh, join. It's free for men. And, uh, but I guess they had women that had a very high willingness to pay. Sorry, guys, I think we have Lester back, so maybe we should yes. give him the opportunity to continue. Okay, so let me just finish the last part. So, uh, I'll continue at this.
as pointed out by patient formation Lester, we still can't hear you. At least I can. No, we can't. Um, Lester, I actually have a suggestion. Oh, he's gone. Um, maybe he can wrap up without slides. I think we can hear him well without slides if he comes back. I think the lesson here is that the uh, the internet test the day before is very important. Yeah, we, we did. Yeah, we did testing. And so, did it, was there were there any issues yesterday? No. So yeah, I, mean, I guess it happens. I don't know. Yeah. Um. So, um, Andre, uh, I'm thinking about just um, just just calling it. Uh, I agree. I think it's, I mean, honestly, it seems like his internet is very bad. It looked like it's red, whatever, red color, which means it's, it's not working well. Okay. So, yeah, so, so thank you very, very much, uh, anyone, uh, everyone who, who participated and uh, thanks to Lester. And uh, I, I still think we, we got some uh, interesting ideas here and obviously questions. And uh, I'm looking forward to another uh, seminar in two weeks. Thank you.